So it is five o'clock, so we're going to have a prompt start. Um, I'm sure more people will be joining very soon. So hello, everyone. We welcome you to today's webinar focusing on menopause. My name is Sophia Ismail, and I am a scientific communicator here at Glycan Age. Hello, um, I'm going to be presenting with Safia. My name is Sophia. Um, and I am a partner relations manager in Glycanage, and I also work part time um, in Genos, which is which is our lab. So we're very excited to present this topic to you, and I'll hand it over to Safia to make the introduction. Thank you. Um, so together we're going to delve into all things menopause. And just a disclaimer to motivate you to stay to the end: um, there will be a winner that will be announced, and will receive a free glycan age test. And this will be followed up with you in an email. So stay tuned. Um, so let's begin. So uh, the following presentation will be delivered to you into segments, with which you will have a quick overview of. So in this first segment, we will cover an introduction into menopause, its associated symptoms its societal impacts, and to what degree menopause impacts a woman's quality of life. So when we discuss menopause, it can be best visualized in the form of a reproductive timeline as seen below. So if we start with the left-hand side, we begin with the menstrual cycle. And this cycle is described to be the monthly series of hormonal changes that the body undergoes in order to prepare us for pregnancy. So each month, um, one of our ovaries will release an egg in a process known as ovulation. And if the released egg isn't fertilized um, during ovulation, then the lining of the uterus is effectively shed through the vagina. And this is the process that we've come to know uh, as being menstruation or a period. So menstruation can start for many girls um, around the age of 12 um, and onwards. Some might start as early as eight, or others might start as late as 15, but they will continue to have a period um, roughly every year into a woman's 40s or sometimes 50s. Next in timeline, we have perimenopause. And this is when changes in ovarian function leads to irregular menstrual bleeding. Many women find their menstrual, many women find their bleeding patterns to become more infrequent between bleeds, or their bleeding pattern might become lighter or heavier. And the average age for the onset of perimenopause is between 47 to 48 years. But it's important to emphasize that this is not fixed and um, perimenopause can even precede menopause anywhere from two to eight years, and even in some cases, 15 years. Next, we have menopause. And this is when you don't experience a menstrual bleed for 12 consecutive months due to the reductions of important hormones in this process, such as estrogen and progesterone. And its average onset is between 51 to 52 years. And finally, we have postmenopause, which is a time in which a woman has not had her period for over a year, and she will no longer have periods for the rest of her life. Now, what I've described to you would be considered the natural progression of menopause. However, menopause can also be induced earlier as a consequence of treating illnesses. Um, one such illness is cancer, and I'll use this as context to explain how the induction of menopause might come about. So when it comes to cancers, there are roughly over 200 types but breast cancer is one of the most common types of cancers that exist. Now, within breast cancers, there's differences. So some breast cancers can be hormone dependent and express receptors for the hormones estrogen and progesterone. In fact, 80% of breast cancers are um, hormone dependent and express positive receptors for estrogen. This means that these cancers can grow in response to um, the presence of hormones estrogen and progesterone as these hormones can activate their respective receptors and lead to the expression of specific genes. And then this ends up promoting uncontrollable cell growth. Now, because the ovaries are the main source of estrogen in pre-menopause women, and therefore contributes to cancer growth, estrogen levels in these women can be reduced by suppressing or eliminating ovarian function. For instance, this can be done surgically by removing the ovaries. And this type of treatment usually eliminates ovarian function altogether. Therefore, it's not desirable for women that still want to have children. Alternatively, ovarian function can be suppressed temporarily by treating with drugs known as gonadotrophin-releasing hormone agonists, or GNRH. Um, and these drugs effectively interfere with the signaling pathways that stimulate the ovaries to produce estrogen in the first place. So examples of ovarian suppression drugs include gocelerin and lupromide. 
Now, the abrupt discontinuation of ovarian function in premenopause women has been associated with more severe consequences than um, natural menopause. So, for example, um, there is an increased risk of experiencing cardiovascular diseases, cognitive impairments, and um, being negatively impacted by sexual function. Now, um, when it comes to symptoms, um, a wide host of symptoms can be experienced by women. Um, some of the most common symptoms that have been reported previously include night sweats and hot flashes, and this is commonly referred to together as being vasomotor symptoms. You can also experience urinary incontinence, loss of libido, vaginal dryness, which has um, impacts to one's sex life. Uh, you can experience mood changes, such as irritability, or even just being agitated in general. You can go through depressive episodes and anxiety. You can experience insomnia or the inability to sleep properly at night. Um, and you can also experience a difficulty of concentrating or brain fog and more. So why am I telling you this? I'm not telling, this, I'm not telling you this to be scared. <laughs> this is because collectively we need to shift our focus and view menopause like a fingerprint where no two experiences are ever going to be really identical. There are over 30 recognized symptoms, some of which we have covered in the previous slide. And on average, a woman can experience up to eight of those and in different combinations. In fact, some symptoms such as hot flushes can be experienced more frequently and more severely than others, whilst some women might be lucky enough to experience no menopausal symptoms at all. So to put this into perspective for you, let's go through how symptoms might differ on the basis of ethnicity. So the British Menopause Society released a guide for clinicians describing um, menopause in ethnic minority women. So if we look at Afro women of Afro-Caribbean origin, um, it was found that they were more likely to experience a longer duration of menopause transition, i.e. they were more likely to experience a longer duration of perimenopause. They were also more likely to experience um, a longer and more severe vasomotor symptoms. Remember, this means night sweats and hot flashes. And they were also more likely to experience more sleep disturbances and therefore experience a less efficient sleep. Now, let's contrast this to women of Southeast Asian or East Asian origin, for example, Chinese and Japanese women. So um, they might not experience any vasomotor symptoms at all. However, they are more likely to suffer from low libido and sexual pain. And they are also more likely to suffer from joint and muscle pains, as well as forgetfulness. Now, before discussing the implications of menopause, it's important to understand the scale that um, menopause impacts women worldwide. So by the year 2030, which is less than seven years away now, it's estimated that 1.2 billion women worldwide will go through menopause. In the United Kingdom alone, approximately 13 million women currently grapple with symptoms associated with perimenopause. Whilst in the United States, it's estimated that 6,000 women enter menopause every single day. So if we decided to add up the number of years that women are impacted by their menopausal symptoms, we effectively have um, potentially up to eight years of perimenopausal symptoms combined with menopausal symptoms that can persist up to seven years. And in total, we have 15 years where a woman's quality of life is being severely impacted. Now, menopausal symptoms may feel particularly extraneous as they often coincide with a woman's vital societal roles. This can be within the workplace or within her own family. This is highlighted by a 2019 research and survey commissioned by the menopause advocate company, Health and Her. And their report reveals that 370,000 working women in the UK aged between 50 to 64 admitted that they have left or considered leaving their career because um, they found dealing with their symptoms in the workplace too difficult. A survey of 634 women in the same age range also revealed that almost 46% said that they have never taken any time out of their working week in order to alleviate a menopausal symptom. And if we look at this from a mental health perspective, a survey of 2,000 women aged between 46 um, and 60 found that 9% of women who have experienced perimenopause have contemplated suicide. 86% admitted to suffering from mental health issues, yet 80% don't even speak to their own partners about this. And these mental health issues have had a direct negative impact in their workplace. With almost 25% of perimenopausal women admitting to making mistakes at work, whilst 15% admitted to phoning in sick. 
Now, for the most part, menopause is a completely natural experience that every woman will experience at some point later in her life. However, the psychological, physical and societal impacts of menopause can no longer be under underplayed or ignored. And it therefore needs to be viewed from a longevity perspective. And here I'll hand over to Sophia. Thank you, Sophia, for this lovely introduction into, um, into menopause. And now that we have introduced this topic, I think we need to dive more into the culprit of all of these changes and these, uh, this is estrogen or more accurately, it's estrogens. So estrogens, it is a family of four different hormones, which includes estrone, estradiol, estriol, and estetrol. The two later ones, later ones are pregnancy related, so we will not be discussing them today. However, estrone is the one that is predominant in menopause, while estradiol, and this is probably the one that you have heard about, estradiol is the one that is responsible for all of the functions that we think about when we think about estrogen, right? So it is, it is responsible for the development of primary and secondary sexual characteristics and for regulating our reproductive function. However, um, this is not the only function of estrogen or estradiol because uh, we have receptors for um, estradiol on most of our cells. And this is why we say that um, it has a systemic impact, so it will impact our heart, our bones, our skin, our hair, our brain, and more. Um, so people usually think that it is produced only in ovaries because it is considered a sex hormone. However, that is not true. Um, it is also produced in our adrenal glands and also in our fat cells. And what I think is important to know and to um, emphasize is that estrogens, they impact our whole body, it in, but mostly our musculoskeletal, um, cardiovascular, and our neuro neurological systems. Now, um, as we progress, it's important to understand how estrogen changes throughout our life. And uh, you can see this on our graph um, or on this picture. So uh, Safia has um, described the the life of a woman right from start to finish but let's see what happens with estrogen here so in our adolescence when we start developing uh, sexually estrogen rises and this is what you can see this is the first jump in this in this in this picture so this is what uh, promotes the development of primary and secondary sexual um, um, sexual functions and then in our in our uh, reproductive age, estrogen is usually it is high, but it goes um, it changes in cycles in our menstrual cycles, right? And then as we approach perimenopause, uh, this changes. So estrogen starts fluctuating a lot, and we will see in the next slide why this happens. And once our egg cell reserve is um, is empty, then estrogen does not cycle anymore because we do not have any more menstrual periods. And this is what we define as menopause. So we do not have any egg cells left or oocytes left. And this is why the estrogen levels are continuously low in menopause. So let's take a closer look at what happens uh, throughout our transition from, um, from our reproductive age to this menopause and post-menopause. Um, um, period in our lives. So as I said, as we enter perimenopause, um, the number of egg cells left to mature is lower. But what our body wants to do, it's, it wants to keep us fertile for as long as possible. And this is what activates compensatory mechanisms in our body to attempt to preserve fertility for as long as possible. So how our body does this, um, it increases follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and luteinizing hormone or LH. And these levels keep rising because as I said, our body wants to keep us fertile for as long as possible. Uh, because of this altered hormonal balance, so this is not something that our body is used to, um, the cycles become irregular and they usually become longer than they have been in, in the previous stage of our life. 
as we transition to menopause or as the egg cell reserve is lower and lower, this ends up in very, very high levels of FSH. And as we deplete the egg cell reserve, estrogen does not cycle anymore. And this is why it is continuously low. So the last um, the last stage in this is postmenopause. So this is, as Safia said, this is a period when our um, we do not have any more menstrual cycles, and it is indeed characterized by low estrogen levels. So let's see what are the actual consequences of this estrogen loss. So first, obviously, it is hormonal imbalance. This is not something that our body is used to, and this is why we have those um, big fluctuations in our hormones. Um, as we said, ovarian aging is another um, another factor which uh, uh, which happens when when estrogen is low. I mean, this is um, it's hard to say what causes what, what right if low estrogen causes ovarian aging or uh, or the other way around. Um, the other thing that changes with the loss of estrogen is the endocrine response is changed. So the feedback um, the the feedback mechanism doesn't work in the same way that it used to be it used to work before, because again, our hormones are changed. Um, and then finally, what happens is that our cellular, um, on the cellular level, is that uh, there is, we don't have as many estrogen receptors as we used to, because there is not enough estrogen in our body. And this is why the signaling pathways are also altered. And this affects all of our, most of our tissues because estrogen receptors, as I said, are very, um, are very common in our body. So what this means in terms of our organs, right? So what we will first see are metabolic changes, and this is seen as weight gain um, and insulin resistance. Uh, women also often have urogynecological symptoms. So this is vaginal and urinary issues. Um, and then we have bone health, which is another huge, um, huge uh, thing that we experience in in menopause and perimenopause we have all heard that women who enter postmenopause they um they are more prone to osteoporosis we then have skin and tissue problems an increased risk of cardiovascular um, uh, disease heightened blood clot risks as well um Cognitive decline is another huge change that happens and that we need to be aware of, and specifically um, that the risk for developing a neurodegenerative um, disease is higher. And then finally, um, the last change that I want to mention is inflammation, and we will be focusing on this more in our discussion because this kind of um, encompasses everything that we have spoken about because inflammation isn't located in one spot in your body rather it is a systemic uh, is a systemic effect which uh, can worsen all of the other symptoms that i've just uh, listed for you now let's talk about this inflammation right so estrogen itself when we are in our reproductive um, part of our life estrogen has this protective effect and we can almost say that it is an anti-inflammatory agent in our body. So how does it do this on, on a cellular level? So we know that it downregulates the expression of different adhesion and chemokine molecules, and it also attenuates leukocyte recruitment and the adhesion of endothelium. Basically, as I said, what this means in simple terms is that estrogens act as an anti-inflammatory agent in our body. Now, when estrogen is low, this can be seen in different ways, but if we are looking at biochemical indicators, it will be a higher concentration of pro-inflammatory cytokines, it will be an increased neutrophil to leukocyte ratio, and it will be seen as elevated levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now, what does this mean clinically? We know that women um, in menopause and postmenopause, they have a worsening of pro-inflammatory um, conditions that they had already in their life, so the pre-existing conditions. Their overall immune system response is stronger, which may lead to the, to the development of autoimmune diseases, and this is seen as a higher susceptibility to autoimmune conditions in, in women who are in menopause or postmenopause. Now, um, there 
you probably are aware that there are different kinds of inflammation. There is a good kind of inflammation and there is a bad kind of inflammation. So let's talk about this for a bit. Now, inflammation is vital for our body, right? Uh, this We need this inflammation to fight off injuries, um, infections, and toxins. So this is a protective mechanism uh, that will lead us to healing, like healing our body from all of these um, injuries. However, um, if this process goes on for too long and it is unresolved, we are looking at chronic inflammation. Now, as I said, acute inflammation is short term. It is a rapid response to um, a, an injury or infection, and it is characterized by this characteristic, right? Pain, redness, swelling, and heat. We all know this. Um, and we also know that it can be measured by increased levels of certain blood components, such as CRP, leukocyte, cytokines, and so on. Now, as I said, pro prolonged inflammation is not good for us because it it leads to chronic inflammation, right? If it is unresolved, um, this is these are conditions like arthritis, asthma, heart disease, and different autoimmune diseases as well. There's more, uh, but this one is very very hard to measure, right? Because if you do a one time point measurement, it will not give you a picture of you know how long this inflammation has been going on and what's really going on in the body. It can be assessed through looking at these different factors in many different time points. However, this is not optimal in a clinical setting. So this is why um, we would have to look at different biomarkers to help us um, define this chronic inflammation and to diagnose this chronic inflammation. Um, so uh, Safia, you can go on here. Thank you, Sophia, for um, that in-depth explanation of estrogen. And now in this segment, we will review the long-term impacts of menopause. We will discuss what FSH is and why um, using this test is unreliable. And we will also discuss why measuring cytokines um, is also unreliable. So um, now as introduced by Sophia, estrogen and progesterone um, play crucial protective roles and its chronic depletion during menopause brings about serious um, health risks associate and, um, associated with conditions and specific syndromes. So for example, estrogen is renowned for its cardioprotective properties, therefore it's very beneficial for our heart. Estradiol or E2 is able to activate cardioprotective signaling pathways within our bodies and reduce the presence of reactive oxygen species. Now, E2 can also protect against oxidative stress by increasing the production of powerful antioxidants such as hydrogen sulfide. And because of such, um, because of such protection, premenopause women have a lower incidence of developing cardiovascular disease compared to males who are in the same age range as them. And they even tend to develop cardiovascular diseases around a decade later than men. Um, however, um, postmenopause women end up producing less estrogen over time, and therefore postmenopause women face a similar, if not an increased, risk of cardiovascular disease to, compared to men. Moreover, estrogen influences calcium utilization, which is essential for bone health, and it also contributes um, to maintaining healthy blood cholesterol levels. Um, but following menopause, women are more susceptible to developing bone degenerating conditions such as osteoporosis, which we probably all know of, and therefore um, they can become more prone to developing fractures from very simple and minor falls. Um, so with people better understanding the implications or risks associated with menopause, more and more individuals are trying to get ahead of it in any way that they can. Currently, there are tests that are being advertised as being useful for diagnosing menopause, um, which are in fact quite inaccurate and very misleading. So one such test would be the measurement of FSH levels, um, as this has gained um, significant popularity over the last couple of years, owing to its widespread advertisement and over-the-counter accessibility. But it's important that we take a step back um, and describe what FSH is. So follicle stimulating hormone or FSH is a hormone that is essential for the um, reproductive systems of women as it helps regulate the menstrual cycle. Um, and it's also important for stimulating the growth of eggs in order to prepare it for its release, for its release during ovulation. But during menopause, when the levels of estrogen and progesterone usually decline, there is an increased secretion of FSH from the pituitary gland in our brain 
which is interpreted as being an indicator for reduced ovarian function. And um, however, relying on just a single test of FSH measurements can be very misleading, so much so that the chair of the British Menopause Society and the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists do not recommend its use for detecting menopause or perimenopause. It's important to recognize that these are two very important bodies of authority in the UK especially, and they provide a lot of education um, and advice and guidelines for the healthcare professionals here. This is because FSH, FSH levels may vary and rise to postmenopausal ranges in some cycles, but return to premenopausal levels in subsequent ones during perimenopause. Moreover, FSH tests might not be very might not yield any valid results for women that are using certain hormone therapies. Um, for example, if they're on the pill, if they're taking birth control pills, since the synthetic estrogen and progesterone in your body goes on to then suppress FSH levels already. Now, it's important to recognize that, therefore, a precise diagnosis requires a qualified healthcare professional who can conduct a thorough medical examination. And this includes reviewing a woman holistically. So, therefore, you need to take into account a woman's medical history, her menopausal history, and what their current symptoms are right now. Um, so questions were then raised about if we can measure the cytokines that were potentially associated with menopause. And this is something that Sophia briefly mentioned. So when it comes to cytokines, for those of you who don't know, think of them as these chemical messengers that are basically being released by the body in order to help coordinate immune responses, like little chemical messengers. So research reveals that postmenopausal women experience alterations in their immune systems, and this is attributed to estrogen deprivation. And this results in elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-6, IL-1, and TNF-alpha, or 2-menocrosis alpha. Um, factor alpha. However, using these cytokines to measure um, chronic inflammation might become incredibly difficult due to the fact that they often overlap with acute inflammation. Um, and it's important to remember that acute inflammation can be temporarily caused by recent sickness or injury. Um, and it's also important for the healing process. Moreover, um, despite kits detecting pro-inflammatory cytokines that were previously described existing, they are often quite expensive and they are not standardized. So they might not yield valid results or consistent results for you to be able to analyze properly. And here I'll pass it back over to Sophia. Thank you. So um, if FSH doesn't work, if cytokines doesn't, they don't work. Um, so let's see what might be working. And before we delve into this part, I just want to have a disclaimer or tell you a disclaimer. Um, if you have any questions here, so this will be quite science heavy um, because I want to present our some of our studies to you. So if you have any questions while I'm talking about this, please let us know. Um, and I'll, I'll happily address it and, you know, explain this in more detail to you. Um, if not, we would be happy to take questions at the end of the webinar as well. So let's dive into, into glycans, which are my favorite topic. So let's, um, let me explain what glycans are to you. So um, they are together with proteins, with our nucleic acid and with our lipids. They are one of the four fundamental building blocks of life. Um, they are present on most of, our, most of our proteins, most of our lipids, and on every cell surface. And um, previously, we didn't know that they had a role, but right now we know that glycans can't be ignored anymore. So they are not a standalone entity. So glycans cannot exist on their own. They, as I said, they bind to proteins and to lipids through a process that we call a post-translational modification. And this is not just a minor addition. Uh, this binding or this um, this compound or this protein, glycoprotein that, um, that um, is the result of this process is the final entity, right? So a protein most likely cannot work function without the post-translational modification. Um, so the glycans themselves, they look like this, these antennas that you can see in the middle of the slide. They are built of many, many small subunits. And um, as I said, there are many, many different proteins in our body that are glycosylated. However, the one that we are looking at is called the immunoglobulin G. Now I will skip this slide. Um, 
to uh, explain this in more detail to you, and then we'll come back to it. Now, um, the immunoglobulin G is the central protein of our adaptive immune system. And what the glycans on the immunoglobulin G do is they determine its function. So when it binds to our different to different cells and uh, to other parts of our biology, the glycans are actually the ones that have a say in what will be the final result of this interaction. Will this be an anti-inflammatory response of our immune system or will it be a pro-inflammatory response? Now, what affects the glycans on our, on our um, proteins? There are many different factors. They depend on our age, they depend on the, our sex, they depend on the ethnicity that we are, um, they depend on our lifestyle, uh, they depend if we have any chronic um, diseases, and so on and so on. And this is what we describe as the theory of inflammaging, which basically says that as we age, our inflammation levels and specifically chronic inflammation levels, they will go up. And this is what glycans can follow. The cool thing about glycans is that they can be changed. So as I said, they follow you in your different lifestyle choices and so, right, and chronic diseases and so on and so on. So um, the glycans can be changed and those are good news, right? So glycans can be changed as I said, with different lifestyle modifications and we can see those changes in three to six months after starting um, an intervention. And we will discuss this a bit later on, but I just want you to be aware of that. Now, uh, sorry, going back to the previous slide, I want to tell you about how do we measure those glycans, right? This is the, the most important part. So we measure them from blood. And in our kit, there is everything you need for sampling. So the Lancet, the alcohol wipes, the blood collection cards, the band-aids, and so on. Uh, this is a simple uh, finger prick test. We need four drops of blood um, and you ship the sample back to us, to our lab. We analyze those, sa those samples. We extract the glycans from them and we look at 29 different structures. And I think you saw this in, the, in this slide. So rule of thumb is the longer the glycan, the more anti-inflammatory it acts, but we are basically looking at the balance between the pro and anti-inflammatory glycans. After we analyze your glycans, we create a report for you, which you can access. And then you also um, have a consultation with one of our specialists who will, who will tell you a bit more about what the result mean and what can be what can be um, improved in terms of your lifestyle. So let's move on uh, to the fun part, and those are the, the the studies, right? So the first study that we ever did when we when we published um, the glycan age um, clock is the study where we looked at how people age, right? How their glycans change with age. And we looked at different cohorts, as you can see here on this slide, um, but we seem to find the same, the same pattern of aging. So let's take a look at this, at this part where, let's look at England and let's look at this first trait, which is agalactosylation. Now, what does agalactosylation mean? It means that the glycan, those glycans are short, therefore they are pro-inflammatory. So let's see what happens as we age. Let's first look at the blue line, which represents um, the males. As you can see, their glycans change in a linear fashion. So they change linearly and nothing special uh, happens, right? As we age, our inflammation levels go up and the glycans follow that. However, if we focus um, on the red line, it is not a line at all, it is a curve. And in the beginning of the curve, you can see that we are actually younger than men and our levels of inflammation, of inflammation are indeed uh, lower. However, this huge jump happens as we approach perimenopause and then we meet at the same spot. So women change or they age differently to men. And this is something that definitely has to be taken into, into consideration when we talk about um, inflammation and, and um, menopause, right? Now, 
we weren't sure what was going on actually when we saw this result of women not aging linearly. So we were su suspecting estrogen and we wanted to check that hypothesis. So what we did is we first did a baseline test on around 40 women. Um, and this was, um, we took their glycan age and, um, and we looked at their glycan age results. In all of these women, we suppressed their hormones with, with um, GnRH therapy, which basically puts them in, in um, post-menopausal state uh, artificially. After that, half of the women were put on a placebo and half of them were put on hormone replacement therapy or we supplemented the uh, estrogen that they were lacking. We measured their, their glycan age and we saw amazing results. And I mean, by amazing, I mean that women who were on the estrogen therapy, their glycan age basically remained the same. However, um, women who were put on the placebo, their inflammation levels went up or I, should I say skyrocketed because it's really a huge change um, that we can see. Um, on the glycan age when it comes to hormones. After that, the women were led, you know, to recover um, their normal menstrual cycle function. And um, here, their glycan age returned to the baseline result. So from this, we know that it is indeed estrogen that impacts this sigmoidal curve of aging that we saw in the previous, in the previous study. Now let's dive in deeper as to what happens in this transition from our uh, reproductive age to um, menopause and postmenopause. So these five different graphs, they represent our glycan indexes. And if you remember, I showed you that um, picture with all of the different glycan structures and how we basically present it is that we group them according to their structures. Um, and because they have similar properties. Now, if you can take a look at this picture, you can see that the top three indexes or glycan traits, as we call them, um, in premenopausal women, they are all in the same level, but this is not important, right? This is uh, when our estrogen function is normal. However, as we get older or as we approach perimenopause, all of these, which are pro-inflammatory glycans, they go significantly up, right? And this is in the perimenopausal uh, stage of our lives. After perimenopause, our body seems to accept its fate. It seems to learn how to regulate this lack of estrogen. And then our pro-inflammatory glycans, they start going down. However, they don't really come down to the starting point. At the bottom, you can see the anti-inflammatory glycans um, or anti-inflammatory indexes, however you want to call them. Um, they drop in perimenopause. So as we said, this anti-inflammatory function of estrogen drops, and we can see that with glycans. And then it sort of restores as we enter this menopausal uh, stage of our life. Now, all of this can be indeed seen with glycan age as well. And we will show, show you in a bit how to, how to use that for yourself or for your patients if you are a practitioner. Now, one disclaimer, and this is for everybody who is in this um, pre or perimenopausal stage of their lives, if you still have your menstrual period of or if your patient still has their menstrual period, um, it is important to know that the stage of their menstrual cycle will not impact the results of the glycan age, because as I said, it will usually take three to six months for you to be able to see changes, to see changes with any intervention, and same goes for the menstrual cycle. So this will not uh, have any impact on the glycan age result. Therefore, you can um, you can test yourself or your client at any point in their in their menstrual cycle. One quick mention here, um, 
I want to say that glycan age is not just for predicting or um, discovering perimenopause and menopause. It can also be used to um, discover the risk for um, the diseases associated with perimenopause and menopause. For example, we know that for cardiovascular disease, we have a marker that is even more predictive than the American Heart Association score. And this is specifically for women. So for men, we don't have this information, but for women, we know that this specific index does indeed have a higher predictive score than the American Heart Association, um, uh, Heart Association score. Um, this is for cardiovascular disease. We also have this for diabetes and specifically type two. So there is a huge potential here. And as I said, we'll tell you a bit more on how to, how to use glycan age for those to get that information. And now to summarize everything that we have spoken uh, about until now. So um, glycans in menopause, the link is uh, undeniable, right? We know that women's aging accelerates during perimenopause, which is reflected in the glycan structures and understanding these changes can help in early detection and management of age-related age conditions. Um, we also know that estrogen modulates glycosylation patterns and monitoring these patterns um, can give us more insight and help us guide personalized treatments and lifestyle adjustments during menopause. Um, glycans are also, as we said, an inflammation marker. So changes in the glycan structure, they can indicate increased inflammation in perimenopause and menopause, but also other diseases which are associated with those states, as we said. Um, and this uh, can serve as a valuable marker for clinicians to manage systemic inflammation and also related health risks. And as we said in the last slide, uh, glycan profiling has shown has shown really promising results in predicting diseases such as cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and so on. So incorporating lichen analysis could really enhance disease prediction and prevention strategies, especially in women's healthcare. Back to you, Safia. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so when it comes to uh, treatments and lifestyle modifications, there, there are many avenues available in order to better manage menopausal symptoms as a whole. But it's important to recognize that menopause is a highly individualized journey. So it's important to try and tailor the interventions to best meet the needs of each individual woman. So in the following slides, we'll look at two aspects. We'll look at pharmacological interventions. So this will include HRT, SSRI and SNRIs, whilst you will also look at non-pharmacological interventions such as diet, exercise and CBT. So let's begin with HRT, also known as hormone replacement therapy, which um, some of you might have heard of, some of you might have never heard of. Now, HRT is one of the main ways of managing menopause. HRT effectively involves administering key hormones, estrogen and progesterone, which naturally decline due to menopause. Um, and this helps to alleviate many of the symptoms that are associated with perimenopause and menopause at the source. Moreover, HRT can be taken in many different forms in order, in order to suit the needs and preferences of different women. So this can be, for example, in the form of a pill, in the form of a gel, um, or in the form of a patch for those of you that don't actually enjoy needles. Um, but not only that, as these different administrations can also help accommodate for certain risks that are associated with the roots of administration. So for example, patches and gels um, forms of HRT are effectively known as transdermal administration techniques. And this means that HRT is basically being directly absorbed from the skin and into the bloodstream. And what this does is that it bypasses the liver and this can lead to less side effects that are experienced by an individual. In addition to this, um, the liver is a very important organ that produces a lot of clotting factors. So um, this these clotting factors are associated with blood clots, right? So if you take estrogen in the form of a tablet, there is a small increased risk of a blood clot occurring. Therefore, um, if you're an individual with a history or a risk of developing um, or experiencing blood clots, there is no risk of clots for women that use transdermal estrogen forms. That being said, it's important to appreciate that HRT is not going to be suitable for everyone. 
for example, um, women undergoing breast cancer treatment may be instructed to avoid HRT because um, some hormone dependent cancers may grow in response to estrogen. So cancer treatments focus on blocking estrogen to prevent its growth and HRT is basically impacting that directly. Um, and it's also important to talk about the fact that historically HRT has had a really bad rep that's quite deep rooted um, in misunderstanding. So the most popular misconception is that HRT causes cancer. Um, and this might be partly because it's conflated with the advice to avoid HRT if a woman, for example, um, possesses a high risk of developing um, endometri endometrial cancer apologies, as well as undergoing breast cancer treatment. But this is a very complex um, topic and new research is constantly coming out. So it's important to effectively discuss your options with an oncologist or a menopause specialist who has a deep understanding of your medical history and can support you in your decision-making process and can also help you in optimizing your HRT dosage. Now, numerous studies have been conducted demonstrating the effectiveness of HRT um, and our own research at Glycanage has revealed some preliminary results um, demonstrating the effectiveness of HRT on reducing actual glycanage. Uh, so when we look at these results, I want you to pay attention to both graph, um, both graphs showing time points one on the x-axis. And these results show that um, on average, after three months of using HRT, glycan age um, on average decreased by around six years, whilst after six months of using HRT, glycan age decreased on average by eight years. Next, we move on to SSRIs and SNRIs. So um, SSRIs are known as selective serotonin uptake inhibitors, whilst SNRIs are serotonin norepinephrine reuptake um, inhibitors. And these are two additional pharmacological interventions that have been proven in, effect in effectively managing um, hot flashes as well as night sweats, so your, your vasomotor symptoms. And these are a type of medication um, that you might recognize as they're used to treat depression and anxiety, which um, are also commonly associated with menopause. And they do this by effectively increasing the levels of mood-related chemicals. So for SSRI, this would be serotonin, whilst for SNRIs, this would be norepinephrine, and this would be in the brain. Um, research has revealed that combining SNRI ven venlafaxine, apologies for the pronunciation, along with estradiol, helped to significantly reduce the frequency of both night sweats and hot flashes. However, just like HRT, um, SSRIs and SNRIs are both medications, and um, they might they're probably not going to be recommended for breast cancer treatment for breast cancer treatment for breast cancer patients that are undergoing um, or taking tamoxifen, as they may hinder the conversion of tamoxifen into its active metabolite. So it might diminish its effectiveness as a cancer, as a drug for cancer treatment. Additionally, like all medications, SNRIs and uh, SSNIs um, have their own side effects, such as nausea, dizziness, and um, nervousness as well. Now that we've covered the pharmacological um, interventions, it's time to move on to the non-pharmacological interventions. So we begin with diet. Um, so we know that our diet um, has a profound impact on our health and it's one of the most modifiable interventions available. After all, we kind of are what we eat, right? So many of the dietary changes um, help ensure that women undergoing menopause have enough of the correct nutrients that they need to support their bodily functions. Additionally, um, Diet may also help to alleviate some of the symptoms associated with menopause. This would primarily be, for example, hot flashes and vaginal dryness. So, for example, um, eating calcium rich foods such as um, yogurt, milk and kale can help keep your bones healthy, especially when menopausal women are at risk for osteoporosis. Um, in addition to this, vitamin D and vitamin K further supports calcium um, and its absorption into the body and therefore helps um, in preventing and reducing the instances of fractures. Um, now, many women effectively want to, uh, want to improve their diet, but don't actually know uh, where would be a good place to start. Um, therefore, looking at elements of Mediterranean diet and starting to incorporate um, certain foods from there is a really great place to start and simple. So this can be done by consuming more vegetables, more seeds, more beans, um, eating seafoods, which is quite rich in omega-3 and is known to have anti-inflammatory properties, 
um, as well as unsaturated fats such as olive oil, which can help manage your cholesterol levels. Now, the next pharmacological, non-pharmacological intervention I'd like to discuss is cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And this is an interesting intervention when it comes to menopause. Um, so for those of you that don't know, CBT is effectively a type of talking therapy that can be very helpful in managing some of the psychological symptoms associated with, men with menopause and perimenopause. And these are symptoms such as stress, anxiety, and depression. And this might come as a shock to you as it was for myself, but studies do support its effectiveness in also managing vasomotor symptoms. So this would be hot flashes and night sweats, right? Um, so much so that one study found that in 140 women um, that participated in group CBT sessions for 46 weeks, so this total to around um, eight hours, 50% reported a significant improvement in their quality of life, as well as reductions to the symptoms that were previously described. And now the final non-pharmacological intervention that I like to discuss is exercise. So um, it's vital that menopause women maintain their muscle mass, not only to remain strong, but it also improves your bone density, especially when you are at risk for osteoporosis. So exercises are proven to help already alleviate stress and improve mood, which is essential for counteracting the depressive episodes and anxiety that is already associated with perimenopause and menopause. Um, and exercise may also help reduce the instances of hot flashes and experiencing a lot of back pain. So where to start? The key is to start slowly um, and just do simple things that you enjoy. This can be walking, this can be cycling. If you are a person that loves to be in your garden, doing some vigorous yard work, um, starting to swim or going back to swimming, going back to your cardio machines or attending group fitness exercises such as yoga would be great. And um, research suggests that an exercise program for postmenopausal women should include um, an endurance exercise, a strength exercise, and a balance exercise. And that on average, uh, weekly, we should aim for around two and a half hours of moderate um, activity to be done, which if you break across the seven days of the week is around 20 minutes a day of exercise. So it's quite low commitment should you find the time. However, um, this should be taken with a grain of salt um, and it's important to understand that women with conditions such as osteoporosis already should be careful with undertaking high impact exercises or activities um, which might result in a fall occurring and here I'll pass it back over to Sophia again. Hey so this is our last segment before we conclude this webinar and I would like to present two case studies to you because we have been talking about, you know, lichen age and different lifestyle interventions. But now the question is, how do you use that either for yourself or for your patients? So let's take a look at these. Um, the first, um, the first case study that I have for you is is a woman who came to us with um, with a biological age of forty eight, while her chronological age was fifty one. Now, um, her journey to find effective medical treatment, it was a long one and a challenging one. Um, she says that she spent seven or eight years trying to find a professional which would be suitable for her. She describes a lot of the symptoms that she, that she had. So from chronic fatigue, memory issues, muscle, uh, muscle aches, uh, concentration problems, extreme hot flashes, uh, up to 50 a day, um, to night sweats, heart palpitations, sensory overload. And as you can imagine, these symptoms significantly impact, impacted their um, daily life and also their work. So once she finally found this specialist that was able to help them, she was put on body identical HRT and she also made some lifestyle adjustments. Um, after that, she says that all of the symptoms were alleviated. So she started sleeping better and um, her she didn't feel any joint pain. And also generally the quality of life was improved significantly. Now you can also see that all of these positive changes in her life and in her quality of life were followed by a reduction of 20 um, glycan age years. So the inflammation was reduced together with her symptoms and we consider this an amazing result. And one thing I want uh, I want you to uh, take a look at is that it only took um, around, what it was, a couple of months 
to to see this amazing change and improvement in her life. Now, this is another interesting um, case study, and this is a client who had um, a, something that we would consider a great biological age. So she was 35 years old, old biologically and 47 uh, chronologically. So this would be around the age of perimenopause, and this is where she started feel, feeling some of her symptoms. Um, this patient, she um, she already had a holistic approach to her health because she was managing her celiac disease by um, altering her lifestyle habits, right? And this is why she had such a good um, such a good biological age. However, it was still not enough to for her not to feel the normal, the regular symptoms of of menopause or perimenopause at this point. So um, she found a specialist that not only um, gave her a prescription to um, hormone replacement therapy, to HRT, but she also introduced some dietary changes and lifestyle adaptations. She also introduced some stress management techniques, as you can see here. So um, more downtime and some breathing techniques and meditation as well. And she had um, a slow decrease in her biological age, as you can see. So she went from 35 to 20 um, in a span of um, a bit more than a year. And um, 20 is actually the lowest you can go with our test. So we can confidently say for this woman that she optimized her health um, and um, what's more important that she didn't feel any of these symptoms anymore. Her celiac disease was managed, her menopause symptoms were managed, and we managed to follow all of that with the glycan H test. So I will let Safia conclude the webinar now, and I can see we have some questions now, and I'm excited to, to answer them after we conclude the webinar. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so when we think about glycan age in a clinical setting, um, so in addition to conducting regular clinical biomarkers, glycan age, a glycan age test can basically be taken to identify a baseline biological age for an individual. And then you go on to provide a series of interventions. And this can be specific lifestyle adjustments that you start off with, or it can even be, be with, um, for example, helping your clients start hormone replacement therapy. And then after three to six months of carrying out such interventions, a glycan age can then be remeasured again. And then you can see how much your glycan age has changed from the baseline, in addition to your um, client's anecdotal feedback about their symptom control and how we can um, we can tailor uh, this the certain intervention that you are undertaking currently, what's working, what isn't working in order to support further reductions um, in glycan age by the next test. So um, now uh, Glycan Insights is a new feature that basically brings about an unprecedented level of personalization when it comes to health assessments, because what it does, it enables you to pinpoint exactly to a great accuracy um, the potential health risks that, are, that a client may face. So our data scientists, our data experts and our scientists have developed a very sophisticated algorithm. And this compares the characteristic glycan index changes associated with various diseases to your client specific glycan profiles. And by analyzing the degree of overlap between these two, this tool can identify which diseases or conditions your client may be most susceptible to or at risk of. So this information is an incredibly powerful guide. It can help you direct your concentration and efforts and further investigative work in order to have a more in-depth understanding about what the potential issues are. And um, among various health states, we can now provide insights into perimenopause. So the addition, um, this addition is going to be um, particularly significant as it can assist you in determining whether a patient um, might be transitioning into perimenopause or menopause, um, allowing you to remain, um, to gain more informed advice as well as personalized care. So to conclude this lovely webinar, uh, it's important to understand that menopause uh, as it is, is a very defining turning point in one's longevity. Therefore, glycan age wants to take a holistic approach, looking at you as the individual and everything around you and understand where you are right now with regards to your own chronic inflammation, as well as your chronic, as well as your current risk factors. 
um, Glycanaid also aims to support you in educating and taking proactive measures now to help mitigate the impact of said inflammation and risk factors. And finally, it can help clients get a tailored support to fit their needs and help not, not just to get by, but to also live life um, to its fullest completely. And for more information about Glycanage, feel free to sign up at partners.glycanage.com. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Safia, for concluding the webinar. Um, I can see we have some great questions in the chat, so I propose that we get to answering them. So the first question is, are there epigenetic aging spikes correlating to increased glycan age, and do the epigenetic markers also reduce with um, uh, BHRT? So to address your first question, this is something that we get very, very often, and it, it's hard to say because epigenetic biological age tests, they are built on their own algorithm and they are looking at a whole another part of our biology when it comes to aging. So we all know that there is 12 hallmarks of aging and epigenetic information or the loss of epigenetic information is one of them. Chronic inflammation or systemic inflammation is another one. So um, the clocks behave in a different way uh, so it's very hard to say, is there a correlation? We do want to um, make a study on looking at this because this is obviously a very hot and interesting topic. Um, but yeah, for now, we don't know the correlation. Now, um, do the epigenetic markers also reduce with body identical HRT? I will be honest, I this is something that I have to look into. So if you could leave me your email, perhaps I would happily look into the literature and then let you know um, the answer uh, that I find. So William, if you could please leave your email, um, I would happily email you after this webinar and um, give you an answer to this question. Um, another question is, does testosterone play a part in reducing inflammation? And um, the answer is yes. So mostly in women, it is estrogen that regulates this, um, this inflammation, right? Um, but testosterone is also very important for the balance between in our in our body for the hormone balance, both for men and for women. So I would say for women, it is important. However, estrogen is more important. And for men, um, it is crucial the balance between testosterone and estrogen uh, for for men is absolutely um, crucial. And this, uh, we know we have a partner who um, does TRT, which is, which is basically hormone replacement therapy for men. And we know that once their inflammation levels are taken care of, and once they are reduced, this has a huge impact on their quality of life. And um and their inflammation. So also their glycan age, obviously, but uh, yeah. Um, the next question is, what's the cost, cost of the test? So the cost of the test can be seen uh, when you sign up at partners.glycanage.com. Um, we, for our practitioners, we have, we have separate pricing and then for our, for our direct consumers, you can also see the, the prices on our, on our webpage. I hope I answered those questions. Um, Safia, if you have anything to add, please. Um, and William, I would ask you to um, to leave your email, please. I think you did a great job, Sophia. Thank you so much for everyone that attended this webinar. I hope it was really informative. Um, and I hope it also provides you with a bit of agency if you are in your own menopause um, journey. And hopefully we'll be hearing from you guys. Thank you, Safia. Thank you, William, for leaving your uh, your email. I I have saved it, and I'll I'll let you know um, the answer as soon as I as soon as I get to it. Thank you all for attending. Um, this webinar was recorded, so we will be sending you the um, the recording, and in that email we will also be announcing the the winner of the giveaway of the free glycanage test. So definitely check check it out. Thank you all, and we'll see you in the next one. Take care, everyone.